baby, we are off to the races. Okay, so we were supposed to talk about opioids and uh, then we didn't. And then I said we would talk about opioids today and now we're not going to. We're gonna talk about weed instead, but we're gonna use the recap from last time. Um, real quick, what are some chronic or some risks of chronic ketamine use? Like you are using it regularly on a consistent basis. What are some organs that can be impacted? I see bladder issues slash bladder sad slash bladder toxicity. And I love the fact that all three of you said it differently. That's great. What other organs might be impacted or processes might be impacted by using ketamine chronically? Liver? Yeah, it's possible. It's possible. That one is like in the realm of things that we're still in the process of researching and figuring out more about because it's possible that liver toxicity can only happen from like really prolonged heavy doses. Not positive there, but it's good to keep an eye out for. What other memory cognition? Yeah, um, there is a possibility that in people that use like really heavy chronic quantities of ketamine, there could be memory deficits that appear to be reversible. Olney's lesions have been not shown ever in humans and Olney's lesions were the thing that caused the big scare about ketamine and relative dissociatives that act on that specific glutamate receptor. Which glutamate receptor is it? What's it called? NMDA, that's right. Is the audio distorted? Any problems? Okay, sorry, Orion. Isolated case. We call that an outlier in data sets. Um, and the other thing that I'm thinking of is another part of your urinary tract. What is another major set of organs that helps process your PP? Come on. Yeah, kidneys, that's right. So um, your kidneys, your liver, basically your pee stuff, your filtration system, the Brita filter of your abdomen is what could be potentially put at risk from doing high doses of ketamine chronically. Your bladder though is at a much higher risk than specifically your bladder, although your entire urinary tract could be at risk, but like your bladder is the main thing that you really wanna look out for. So keep an eye out for that. Okay, so we have kidneys slash urinary tract, your brain sickle, if you if this is really like, if you do a lot of ketamine really often, then you might experience memory deficits. Um, and like I said, it appears that this is largely reversible, but no data set is fully complete because this is such a new practice. And then the possibility of hepatoxicity. Um, what are some neurotransmitters that are acted on by dissociatives? There are four major ones that I'm thinking of right now. Dissociatives are the crossroads. Remember, they act on a bunch of different things. Opioid? Nice, Alexis. That is three of the major ones. And there's one more. There's glutamate, right? That's the main one that dissociatives act on is glutamate. It's your connective, your excitatory neurotransmitter. It facilitates communication, memory, and learning, allows the brain and body to interact with each other, to interface, to collect information, especially about pain signaling. Um, so glutamate is disrupted. It's antagonized. Its effectiveness is reduced by dissociatives. Um, yeah. And then there's the opioid receptors, which are activated by a lot. No. Please make sure to mute yourself if you just came in. I'm gonna have to hunt you down. I found you. Um, opioid receptors are antagonized, or sorry, are agonized as well by certain dissociatives and different levels for each dissociative. And then there's also dopamine. And dopamine is one of those things that's kind of like, here and there, there are certain dissociatives that act more or less on dopamine. So for instance, PCP is considered to be more dopaminergic than other um, dissociatives. And then there's also GABA, which is your natural inhibitory neurotransmitter. It slows your system down. It's what's released in response to you getting hyped up. It is your anti fight or flight basically. And I know that gets a little confusing because the technical opposites here are GABA and glutamate are opposite of each other. GABA is inhibitory, glutamate is excitatory. But when I say that GABA slows you down, a lot of people think, oh, that's the opposite of norepinephrine. I want you to think of this more in terms of what excites your body and what inhibits your body's functionality, basic, or what inhibits your brain's communicativeness, what excites your brain's communicativeness, like facilitate like making connections, reduce making connections. That's what I want you to think of when you think of GABA and glutamate. So the two Gs, 
really go together. GG, am I right? What receptor causes bladder toxicity? Um, it's not a receptor issue. So in the case of bladder toxicity, one of the, so this is the primary mechanism that I understand it working through at this point in time, take it with a grain of salt and grain of K if you must, because this is definitely something that I like, it, the research is unfolding. So this is what I currently know. So like keep reading and doing your own research. This could be proven wrong eventually. So the general idea is that you have a little melon bladder inside your bod and the inside of your bladder is lined with epithelial cells, which are these umbrella shaped cells that are responsible for protecting the blood vessels outside of your bladder from having seepage basically where the toxins in your piss get seeped into your blood vessels and distributed throughout your body basically. So my current understanding is that ketamine um, damages epithelial cells in your bladder. So once little K particles get to your bladder, which is like your, your pee is filtering toxins from throughout, you know, it's like nothing escapes your pee, which is part of why I think that the idea of spitting the drip might not actually be that helpful because ketamine's in your bloodstream. Like even if you spit the drip before you swallow it, like sure, you might reduce some of the ketamine that reaches your bladder, but I don't know if spitting the drip is really that useful, especially because it's disgusting. <laughs> spitting the drip is awful. You have to like, and really hawk down a loogie and then somehow manage to spit it out while you're K-hold. Like it's very difficult. So um, yeah, that's a preventative measure that you could take if you wanted to. I mean, it probably does not hurt except for psychologically. It's like a horrible experience. What's a condition caused by chronic B vitamin deficiency? Starts with an N. That's right, neuropathy, that's correct. Neuropathy is uh, tingling and numbness. It's, it's a kind of like nerve damage to your peripheral nerve that is often reversible in its early stages, but at certain stages can be irreversible if you are like continuously pushing it. And this is something that can happen pretty easily from using nitrous on a regular basis, which is why I recommend that if you're doing nitrous in particular, you should not do it more than like once a month realistically speaking, or I guess I shouldn't put like a, a hard timeline on it. Instead, I should say, if you're doing nitrous, it's probably better to binge in one session. I say lightly, like I'm not trying to advise you to binge on drugs in general, <laughs> but like if you're going to choose between using like a little bit for a long period or like one night and you really go ham, you should probably choose one night and go ham. Just saying. What is the neurotransmitter responsible for muscle control? And I don't want this to be confusing. I'm not talking about dopamine because dopamine is partly involved in muscle control. It's also involved in mood, but there's another one that we introduced last time. It starts with an A. Yes, that's right, acetylcholine. Um, glutamate's a good guess, but glutamate is not the predominant neurotransmitter involved in muscle control. Glutamate facilitates like telling brain, ouchie, body hurt. But acetylcholine is part of the reason like when you are on something like PCP, you have a reduced control over your limbs. It like takes a lot of effort to do stuff. It's a sedative. It knocks you the fuck out for surgery. Um, which two categories of drugs can interact most severely with dissociatives? Umbrella categories, where if you mix these with dissociatives, you might have a bad time. Acetopresence. Hmm, interesting choice of phrasing sedatives and stimulants. So the word sedative is a little bit difficult here because both opioids and depressants as individual classes are sedating. Um, uh, no, Jared, anyone can turn their video on who wants to. It just appears that this particular batch today is not feeling very visual about themselves. But I love seeing you all with your videos on. So if you want to turn them on and like knit or like do paper mache or whatever it is that I interrupted with this. <laughs> like, please feel free. Um, I see stimulant and hallucinogens. That's an interesting hypothesis. So the two major classes that tend to react the most severely with dissociatives, hi Gabe, are um, 
opioids and depressants. And the reason is that even though most dissociatives do not depress your breathing in the same way that something like an opioid or a depressant would, they can still really compound the psychological and like high effects of dissociatives to the point where you get really bad spins or you puke and you choke, or in some cases, um, these, these combinations can lead to respiratory depression. It depends on the specific dissociative that you're using in conjunction. So generally speaking, I would say that, that these categories do not play well together. You should really stick to one of the three major like downer adjacent categories. If you're mixing stimulants, there isn't really anything particularly risky about, yeah, stims and dissociatives might give you anxiety. Stimulants in anything might give you anxiety. I personally do not advise combining stimulants and hallucinogens of any kind just because, or like, okay, no, I changed my mind on that. You can, but I would be really fucking light on the dose of stimulant that you use because otherwise you could really run the risk of like having physical anxiety, which triggers mental anxiety and then you're looping and then that can actually create physical anxiety that becomes dangerous, like arrhythmia level physical anxiety. dipped cigarette wait can you guys still hear me okay <laughs> sorry this is, my airpods just tried to steal this no stims and sykes please yeah okay major note here is taking hallucinogens or stimulants okay doing drugs when you're sleep deprived is like a major major trigger for psychosis major sleep deprivation of like 48 to 72 hours you're in the danger zone like you are predisposed if you are hot if you're sleep deprived or if you're dehydrated you can very easily enter in a state of acute psychosis like and it's estimated that like three in every 100 people in their lives will experience psychosis. Like we really need to destigmatize this. If someone was like, I had a psychotic break, you should be like, oh, like, how can I support you? Not like, oh man, this person is going to spiral. Like be really mindful. Also, yes, you were correct, Hunter. The answer is SHRM. SHRM, embalming fluid, lighter fluid. <laughs> it's not actually lighter fluid. Um, what is the name for the medical term for pain relief? It starts with an A. analgesia. Thank you. Uh, acid and molly are usually okay together. Yeah, there's no major contradiction between acid and molly. Uh, what is this called? This little guy. Okay, well, yes, nitrous. Yes, whip it. But like, what is this container called? What's the slang term for it? Rooster. Thank you. Um, which is the typical whipped cream dispenser. So it's, it looks pretty innocuous but like not actually everyone knows what this is. And then we're gonna ignore that because we didn't really talk about funding. Whoops. And we're skipping that and going to the weed day because I want to be really mindful about doing opioid lecture correctly. Uh, I've heard something about increased neurotoxicity when combining MDMA and LSD. I can think of no reason for that. There is no neurotoxic profile of LSD. There is no reason why this combination should have that effect that I can think of off the top of my head. Yeah. Candy flipping is generally considered to be a relatively low risk combination and synergistic as fuck. Like you should reduce your dosage of both substances, but I would say it's better to reduce your dose of acid than a molly because it really sucks to like not be fully rolling, but also be tripping and acutely aware of the fact that you're not fully rolling. Is Nexus flipping okay too? 2CB and MDMA. That's Nexus flipping for those of you that don't know. Hippie flipping is mushrooms and MDMA. Candy flipping is LSD and MDMA. Nexus flipping is 2CB and MDMA. Kitty flipping is ketamine and MDMA. The borax combo is 4-HOMET, 2FA, MA, and, and uh, whatever. Nightmare flipping. Um, 2CB and MDMA, again, I can't really think of any significant interaction between those two. DPH and LSD. I refuse to engage with that. We're skipping all of that. All right, let's talk about the weed. Okay, cannabinoids. So there's some question marks about what the standard pronunciation for cannabinoid is. 
Um, everyone that I've ever spoken to that works in the industry says cannabinoids. There are occasionally people that say cannabinoids. I'm going to say cannabinoids. And if anyone is like, hello, I work on the board of weed people and it's pronounced cannabinoids, I will happily switch over. But this is just like, there are no conferences right now. What am I supposed to do? You know what I mean? This are THC and CBD. Um, and I'm sure that probably all of you have heard of THC and CBD, but what you might not have heard of are things like CBN and CBG and the other 113 or more cannabinoids contained within the weed. Like each of these cannabinoids has its own completely unique profile and it's a very complicated plant. So much, including yeah, Delta 8 THC, which, and I do not know much about Delta 8 THC. So before you ask, I just am not the authority on that subject. Leafly knows more than I do. Um, but here's an interesting thing that's not in the slides as my tidbit of the day. I might have already mentioned at some point this concept of the entourage effect. So tell me if I've already covered this. But the entourage effect is basically a theory that has notorious and complicated origins about how the reason that weed has such a robust effects profile is because it includes such a wide variety of different substances within each hit, right? So it's not as simple as just isolating a single compound from a substance. And this is something that's like a, a subject of huge debate right now there was the question posed of whether the entourage effect was actually released as a marketing schema, basically, to get people to buy full spectrum products that include like all the colors of the rainbow, like all of these different isolates from, this, from the cannabis plant. Has that much of an actual influence as opposed to, oh my God, this is so annoying. My Bluetooth is going crazy right now. Um, Sorry, I'm reading the chat. Yeah, so there's a big debate going on about the entourage effect and how far it applies. Bros, in regards to the pronunciation of cannabinoids, I'm just going off of the industry expert pronunciation. I'm not pretending to be an expert on this particular subject. I'm My interest area is primarily not in weed, <laughs> to be honest. So, um, yeah, you also wouldn't pronounce it knife, and yet here we are in the English language being stupid, stupid butts. So this entourage effect question is really one that's being hotly debated because yes, there are a lot of people that are reporting having a unique subjective effect from smoking weed that has everything in it, including terpenes, which we'll get to later, as opposed to just like taking a gummy that has only CBD or only THC. And it's pretty uncommon to get like only THC by itself, and we'll see why in a minute. Um, but the question is how far this extends, because it's, it appears to be like at least partially truthful that there is an entourage effect with cannabis, probably. Um, but when it comes to other drugs, it really is like uncertain right now whether things like mushrooms and ayahuasca and peyote and mescaline containing plants and it, basically any plant medicine, which is a phrase that I hate because most things derive at least in part from plants ask any of the decriminalized nature campaigns if they include cocaine in their decrim studies. Um, yeah, so the question extends to things like mushrooms. And mushrooms are a really interesting point to explore here because they have been recently shown to include um, like a whole variety of different like sub compounds, but we don't know how much those sub compounds actually contribute to the psychedelic experience. So it's like, do we need to bother trying to extract and combine all of the naturally occurring ingredients in mushrooms? And is there any kind of actual actionable difference between taking mushrooms and taking straight up psilocybin capsules? So stay tuned. We're still learning more about this all the time. I need to speed this up. Now, um, in response to you saying THC feels very st stemmy to you, whereas flowers and full spectrums feel a variety of ranges of things. Yeah, it, it is definitely like, the thing about that is that THC and CBD have alternate actions that balance each other out. The question is how many of the other cannabinoids are really relevant to producing that effect if they're non-psychoactive. So we'll come back to that in a little bit, we'll elaborate. So in your body, you have a weed system. 
you have an endocannabinoid system. So this is like, wow, like your body is really just like made to accept substances, to be honest. And two of the major endocannabinoids that you have in your body are AEA and 2AG, which are largely responsible for things like feeding behavior and feeling good about exercising, which is a thing that I wish I had more of and motivation and reward. Um, and all of these things are like part of a very complicated system that is essential for regulating basically all of your life without naturally occurring weed stuff basically in your body you would be dysregulated as fuck and we'll see exactly how that was proven by science in a second now scattered throughout your body there are two different kinds of receptors that accept endogenous cannabinoids the first is called cb1 it's predominantly found whoops predominantly found in your brain and central nervous system but it's also found elsewhere and um, CB1 receptors are largely responsible for really influencing your neurotransmitters, but this is not like other substances. There's this is a very complicated science behind this that I've tried to distill into the least overwhelming, overwhelming diagrams ever, but they're still overwhelming, so bear with me in a minute. And then CB2 receptors are predominantly found in the immune system and elsewhere, but like peripherally in your immune system. And this is kind of like the first example of the interplay between these systems, because you have cannabis or cannabinoids basically influencing your neurotransmitters as well as your immune response, as well as your body's ability to respond to inflammation, for instance, like anti-inflammatory properties are one of the major things that are relevant in weed right now. Um, now, the thing about these receptors is that generally speaking, CB1 receptors, I'll answer your question in a second, CB1 receptors basically are responsible for decreasing another neurotransmitter that they're acting on. So this is usually seen in GABA and glutamate. And this is, it's complicated. I'm going to try really hard to make it palatable, but stop me at any time if it's not in a minute, because it's so complicated. Um, basically, weed is the Zen master of your body. It's the one that goes around or the endocannabinoid system, the cannabinoid system in general, cannabinoids in your body go around and are like, Hey man, can we just like all vibe out for a minute? This is getting a little excessive. So it does that. It like goes around and knocks on the door of a bunch of different neurotransmitters and is like, Hey, can we like tone it down? I'm trying to read this book by, by Ram Dass or whatever. And then on the other side, you have CB2, which is responsible for reducing inflammation and other stuff. Now, the whole idea behind this system, the TLDR of the, the endocannabinoid system, is that it wants to maintain homeostasis. If something is too high, uh, oh my god, if something is too high up, it wants to bring it down. That's the idea. Too much activity, bro. Can't we just like all say stuff together? Right. Now, in the brain, here's where things get really complicated. I have kindly procured some images of some birds for you. So let's look at a glutamate neurotransmitter. And then over here, we have a GABA neurotransmitter. We'll come back to in a second. So here's the glutamate neurotransmitter. We have our vesicles, which are the bubbles that contain neurotransmitters. So glutamate is stored in here. We have our receptors down here. We have um, this thing, which I'll get back to in a second, and this thing, which I'll get back to in a second. So this is just like diagram of a neuron. Now, usually neurotransmitters will be popped out of their bubbles, they'll float into the synapse, they'll bind at the receptor and something will happen, right? We know all about this. This is the basics of how neurotransmitters work. But when it comes to endocannabinoid system, endocannabinoids are actually stored in the membrane of the, the neuron with the receptors. So they're, they're packaged in there next to the receptors. Instead of getting released and floating down to bind, they get released and they float up to basically deliver a message. They're like, hey, it's kind of loud down here. Can we like stop being quite so active? It's really late, guys. And then you have something like a GABA neuron, and it does the same thing. It doesn't discriminate between like, oh, this is excitatory, this is inhibitory. Now, this means that there's like a really complicated, a, a lot of double negatives in this system, basically. If you have endocannabinoids working on a glutamate neuron, they're released back and they're like, hey, tone it down. That means that they're going to release the excitatory nature of that neuron, or reduce the excitatory nature of that neuron. On the other hand, if you have endocannabinoids on a GABA neuron, 
they're going to go up and be like, hey, can you tone it down, which will reduce the inhibitory nature of that neuron. No matter what it's acting on, it's reducing it. So this is how weed can produce such variable effects. This is like a, a wild way that it does a lot of like kind of sneaky backdoor things to make you feel this very unique profile of being high. Like, honestly, there are no drugs quite like weed. <laughs> like weed produces a really unique experience of being baked. And part of this is because if you are reducing glutamate's activity by being like, hey, calm down, that could be an anti-anxiety thing. It could be slow reaction time. On the other side of the coin, if you're also going, hey, calm down to GABA, that can actually increase your stimulation. <laughs> like you sometimes get that feeling of stimulation from being baked either socially or creatively or sometimes physically like pleasant body sensations. And this is because you are slowing down certain things that are meant to connect you and also slowing down certain things that are meant to chill you out. <laughs> I know this is crazy. I'll talk about sativa versus indica later. The, the spoiler alert is that they're actually like basically the same. Uh, do you know how and why weed evolved into growing with psychoactive chemicals in it? Was it to pre protect itself against predators? I don't know. Sorry, <laughs> no idea. So here's just like what is going to maybe be a little bit of an overwhelming depiction of how this works. Whoops, surprise Putin. So for some of you, you might be like, this is obvious, I get it. You've explained it thoroughly. For some of you, you might be, I'm completely lost. So I'm gonna beat this horse until it's dead. Within the brain, CB1 receptors are among the most abundant G protein coupled receptors. Blah, blah. However, in contrast to classical signaling, where information travels from pre to post synaptic neurons, the ECS uses retrograde signal. That's endocannabinoid the information system. travels from post to pre synaptic neuron. It's backwards. Let's take a closer look at this mechanism using a glutamatergic neuron model. That's a glutamate neuron. When an action potential reaches the axon terminal, membrane. I know there's a lot of terminology you might not know. That means electricity zaps it, it's ready to pop. Stop. Sorry. Into acting as neural messengers. Oh my god. I swear to you, this is not my fault. The ECS uses retrograde signal. The information travels from post to presynaptic neuron. Let's take a closer look at this mechanism using a glutamatergic neuron model. When an action potential reaches the axon terminal, Membrane depolarization triggers the release of glutamate. That basically means it pops the bubbles. Glutamate binds to postsynaptic glutamate receptors. There goes glutamate to bind. calcium channels to open. We ignore that. During periods of intense neural activity, calcium accumulates in the postsynaptic neuron. <laughs> this calcium buildup causes the synthesis and release of endocannabinoids from membrane lipids. Diffusing across the synaptic cleft, the endocannabinoids bind to the CB1 receptor. All you need to know is that they're going up. the G protein. Activation influences ion flow. <laughs> the result, suppression of presynaptic neurotransmitter release. Endocannabinoids are subsequently taken back into the cell and enzymatically degraded. Okay, so I know that that might have sounded like absolute gibberish to some of you. TLDR, they're embedded in the receptor part, like the next membrane, they're embedded in the postsynaptic neuron. And when there's a lot of activity happening, that's basically their signal to like exit their sleepy caves and be like, stop. So they do that. And the neuron is like, sorry. And then things calm down. Whatever neuron it is, it stops doing quite as much as what it was doing. Um, so let's take a look at this except with Putin because it's been a while since we've had his presence here. So basically endocannabinoids are these birds. They're buried in the skin of the postsynaptic neuron. Now, when there's a lot of activity or certain events happen or even just when you've been smoking weed, which means that there doesn't even have to be a lot of activity for this to happen, then these guys are alerted. They're like, oh man, it's a shit storm up here. And so they fly back up to deliver the signal of like, guys, keep it down, please. It's really loud. Like you're doing a lot of stuff right now. It's too much. And they'll be like, sorry. And then that neuron calms down basically. So this is kind of like 
you got these endocannabinoids or whatever cannabinoids are in your system, you might've just smoked weed, which means that they don't even have to be triggered by a lot of activity in a neuron. They can just come back and be like, yo guys, let's all vibe down. And they basically stroke it and they're like, shh. So whatever it was doing, it's gonna do less. Now, this is called retroactive signaling. So instead of neurotransmitters get popped and they float into the synapse and they bind, it's the opposite. They get released from the postsynaptic neuron, they float up and they're like, shh, and then get destroyed. Yes, it's a regulatory system. I know that this is really like, I don't know how complicated this sounds to you guys, um, but it somehow is even more complicated without all these metaphors. So like, hope it helps. Pass it to the chat. Now, because of this regulatory effect and because of the effect that weed has and that endocannabinoids have on your body's ability to self-regulate and do like feeding behavior and whatever, scientists were like, cool, we could use this as a treatment for obesity. Let's just block the CB1 receptor. Let's just like make it so that cannabinoids cannot bind and like that should reduce feeding behaviors. And they actually had to stop the clinical trials on this drug because of so many negative psychiatric side effects and four suicides. So clearly cannabinoids in the body are really important for regulating essential systems. The big idea behind this is that cannabinoids go backwards. They travel up to whatever neurotransmitters cell that they're embedded in and they're like, stop it, like this is too much. And it's basically giving feedback. These are the messengers that are like too much, that's fine, too much, that's fine. And when you're introducing weed into your system, you don't need a reason to say too much. <laughs> it basically can just go in and be like, everybody vibe out, calm down without a reason. Um, now let's go into more specifics in terms of actual cannabinoids contained within the plant at least. So THCA and CBDA are two such examples of this. They are big fat molecules that get broken down by heat. You can see that a little bit of it breaks off with combustion, that uh, that group right there breaks off with combustion, and that gives you regular THC and regular CBD. Or specifically, regular THC is what we're really looking at here because I get asked the question a lot of, can I eat weed? The answer is, you can eat anything. You can put whatever you want into your body. Will you get high from eating nugs? No, and it will probably taste super bad, although it's a really recent kind of like influencer trend that people are making like weed smoothies, which sounds disgusting to be perfectly honest. So part of the reason for this is that you need to burn off this group of THCA in order to make it into the active THC. I need to mute you if you're not muted. Um, so this is part of why you can bake THCA and it will become THC. That's why edibles work, but you have to bake them. But THCA and TB CBDA are found in the raw plant. The gist of THC, sorry for all you that probably want to know this, gets you high, giggles, munchies, your reaction time is slowed, sensory information appreciated. Um, quite a number of people experience paranoia from THC. The higher THC content in what you are smoking or eating or ingesting or whatever, the higher likelihood you are to have some kind of an uncomfortable experience anxiety wise and paranoia, like it's a correlation. Now, legally, initially THC was scheduled. This is, I just had to update this because as of December, things are different. So in the, I, I don't know if you guys remember, we'd initially talked about the single convention on narcotic drugs in 1961, the single convention was established. This was the first international cooperative effort to shut down drug production basically. And weed has been scheduled in schedules one and four this whole time. And schedule one is basically like high potential for abuse, some medical value two and three get progressively less stringent. And then four, for whatever reason, goes back to being like high potential for abuse, super addictive, no medical value. So it's kind of whack because like it goes one, two, three, four, which is like the most restrictive of all of them for whatever reason. Anyway, the idea is that THC slash weed as a whole had been classified in schedules one and four. And as of December of this past year, the World Health Organization finally removed cannabis and cannabis resin from Schedule 4. Yay! Which doesn't actually mean all that much, but like, whatever. 
Um, meanwhile, in the United States, we're sitting over here eating glue and using Internet Explorer because we currently have THC as Schedule 1, which is indicative of something that has a high potential for abuse and no accepted medical value. And yet, recently, we managed to approve an FDA-regulated related regulated drug, dronabinol, which is THC for seizures and stuff. So the hypocrisy is astounding. And when we finish this lecture next time, we'll look at the real, like, uh, what's the scandal portion of this that has to do with asset forfeiture and patenting and like it gets like there's a rat's nest here. So here are the, the countries that in December um, voted for and against this rescheduling. You can see that like generally speaking, it is more like white Western countries that have predominantly supported this move. Um, and there's like also abstinence from Ukraine in this voting. There's a lot of politics in this diagram, like a lot of politics. So study it well, and you can really learn a lot about the individual drug laws of these countries based on how they treat something like rescheduling cannabis, World Health Organization. Uh, consistently gives me paranoid bad trips, have many will smoke in years. Yeah, that's really real. Like people really underestimate the fact that it's like, like weed can really make you have panic attacks. I know a lot of people that have had serious like hospitalization worthy panic attacks on weed in the last like six months. I think the pandemic is making it worse though. And then there's CBD on the other end of the coin is non-psychoactive CBD does not get you high. It does not get you high. It does not have psychoactive properties. Um, and the interesting thing about this is that CBD and THC are co-regulators. The interplay between them balances out the effects of the other. So CBD is more of the anxiolytic, it's the calming, it's the muscle relaxant, whereas THC is very much more the like psychoactive component of things that is more stimulating and can be anxiety inducing. So the more well-rounded of a blend you have of THC and CBD, the less likely you are to have adverse reactions such as paranoia, such as anxiety. So that might be something to take into consideration here. Now we won't go into all the specific cannabinoids that are contained within weed, but it's really worth knowing that there are so many of them and they have a fucking massive list. Oh my God, how is it possible that every time I turn off all notifications and messaging platforms and there's always notifications that still have it. Um, anyway, Point is, you can do research on these individual ones if you want to, but there are so many things happening within the cannabis plan. In fact, so many things that are currently just being, I have no idea where that sound is coming from, I'm sorry. Like, I have 150 tabs open, I can't find where that's coming from. So, my point is, lots of endocannabinoids, or cannabinoids, sorry. Now, looking at CBD, this is a really interesting thing that happened. Um, until 2016, CBD itself was not scheduled. And then suddenly it was just like weed was scheduled. But suddenly in 2016, there was a new motion to make CBD into a Schedule One drug. It basically was a motion that, that classified cannabinoid compounds like extracted from weed as being their own unique substances that were schedule one as well to make it easier to crack down basically but then conveniently i'm going to go crazy i want to know where that sound is coming from but i can't quit google chrome because my life will fall apart and conveniently in 2018 epidiolex was just approved which was just like a cbd medication that was approved for treating symptoms of epilepsy like that's how it is, you know, we have this schedule one designation. It is a Facebook notification sound. I just have no idea where I could possibly have Facebook open right now. Anyway, it's hypocrisy out the wazoo and we'll see that again later. Uh, now talking specifically about weed, a standard dose of, how much weed I've left in this? Standard dose is like, no one's going to measure out milligrams in weed. I just have this here because I think it's funny. There are a billion names for it. There's weed. If you're a boomer, you might call it pot, or I guess that's regional, like on the East Coast, it's more called pot than on the West Coast. Um, dank or green or marijuana or sticky icky, if you're really extra. Um, there's just like so many names, I can't keep up with them. 
And usually someone will just be like baked or stoned or high or lit. Yeah, ganja, dank, right? Yeah, do dank, doinks. <laughs> Uh, it comes in many, many forms. It comes in flour, which is um, bud. These are referred to as nugs. This is like a crash course for people that just like don't really know anything about weed, just so you know. Um, then it can come in concentrate form. This particular thing right here is a dab, can be otherwise known as wax or butane honey oil or slash BHO. And we'll look at exactly what concentrates are because that's like Sometimes people will pull out a dab rig to do a dab and someone will look at it like it's a fucking like Oompa Loompa meth pipe and have no idea what it is. So I want everyone to know what a dab looks like. Um, and then in rare cases, you might find a brick of Afghan hashish. This is really like not very common anymore though. Let us examine the nug. So zooming way far on, in on this bad boy, we have trichomes and trichomes are these sticky little structures that contain the cannabinoids. So the stickier your bud, probably the more trichomes you have, which means a higher packed concentration of cannabinoids within them. This can be really annoying though, because it really gets on your fingers. Um, then you also have keef. And keef is basically whatever residue is left over from grinding or handling weed. It's basically, it like shakes off the trichomes. And this is just like a collection of trichomes basically. So if you're ever with someone and they have like a bag of weed and there's like a layer of kinetic sand at the bottom and that person goes to throw out the bag, it's pretty likely that everyone they're smoking with is gonna be like, what is wrong with you? Because they just threw out like the highest concentration portion of trichomes because it's just like all at the bottom. Now that um, keef, that like leftover, that, that shaken off sandy collection of trichomes is what gets pressed into bricks to create hashish. So hashish is super concentrated of, with cannabinoids because it's literally just like mushing all of the cannabinoid containing crystal structures together. Um, in terms of what you actually, there's just so much terminology around weed, just got to catch you up to speed. So in terms of like what the different qualities look like, this is very much no longer as much of an issue in states that have regulated markets. But let me tell you back in 2011, when Eli had to roll up to your house in his shitty sedan, you had to really know if you were going to get swag or mids or top shelf. And it was almost always shake or mids. <laughs> Fuck you, Eli, if you're watching this. So uh, shake or reggae or swag or whatever you want to call it is just like bottom shelf weed. It's like long and hairy and stringy and not very sticky and kind of ugly looking. Um, then there are mids, which is just kind of like middle of the road weed. It's more dense nugs. It's not anything particularly special. And then you get fire or top shelf or dank or whatever you want to call it. It's frosty. Like it literally looks frosty because of such highly concentrated trichomes, the sticky crystalline chambers that contains the stuff that makes the magic happen. And also often contains little orange hairs. Let's learn about concentrates. Concentrate is an umbrella term for any form of concentrated cannabis product. Everything from the traditional forms like hash to more modern additions like cannabis oil and distillates. Cannabis concentrates can be created and consumed in a number of different ways. Some are crafted using only heat and pressure, while others utilize chemical solvents like carbon dioxide, butane, or ethanol. All of these different extraction methods serve the same purpose, to separate essential compounds we want, the cannabinoids and terpenes, from the cannabis plant. The result is a potent product that contains all the things we love about cannabis, but in a much smaller package. While some concentrates can be smoked like traditional cannabis, other consumption methods are much more common. Cannabis oils, for instance, are often found in vape pen cartridges or used as ingredients in edibles. Thick concentrates like butters or live resins are often dabbed or vaporized. To learn more about the cannabis concentrates available at retailers near you, check out the rest. And the reason that I'm doing this is because I feel like concentrates are kind of like the unicorn of people not really understanding the next level of how weed works. Lots of factors can impact the quality of a cannabis concentrate, but the first and most important rule is fire in, fire out. Just as you need good ingredients to cook a gourmet meal, 
high quality cannabis concentrates starts with superior cannabis. Cannabis extractions start with a trim run, a nug run, or a live extraction. While both nug and trim runs use dried cannabis as their source material, live resin extractions use fresh plants instead. That's because one of the key components of cannabis flavor and effect, terpenes, are notoriously volatile. They can even dissipate at room temperature. Live resin extractors aim to keep as many of those terpenes as possible present in their final product by running it before it's been cured. No matter how they're extracted, cannabis concentrates can be separated into two camps, full spectrum extracts and isolates. Full spectrum extracts include a full mix of the compounds naturally found in cannabis, including cannabinoids and terpenes, in the exact same ratio you find them in the flower. Isolates, meanwhile, are pinpointed to extract one specific chemical from that profile, usually THC or CBD. While they may lack the nuance of full spectrum concentrates, isolates are potent, easy to dose precisely, and make an easy way to add cannabis compounds to products like edibles or topicals. Some of the most Instagram-worthy concentrates on the market today are known as diamonds, rocks, or gems. Typically, these form when THCA molecules clump together in a raw extract, forming a crystalline, faceted structure. You'll often see THCA diamonds paired with the liquid called sauce. The sauce is the terpene-rich byproduct of the same extraction process. Of course, these are just some of the many cannabis concentrates available to consumers today. To learn more about all the options you have for... So, it's so complicated. Like, weed culture is really, really taken off, you know what I mean? Now, Good we're going to learn how to take a dab with Bucky, who I love. You would end up with butane left in your product, which leaves a soupy mix that you do not want to smoke. And these are the ingredients to a good dab session. One rig filled with water, a torch filled with butane of your choice, a dabber carb cap, dab or carb cap combination if you have it, one quartz ceramic glass or titanium nail, and the concentrate of your choosing. The size of dab you take is up to your tolerance. You should always start small and work your way bigger. The Seriously. average weed that you smoke is in the 15 to 25% THC range. Concentrates can range in the 65 to 85% range. So make sure you know what you're doing before you inhale. That's a big dab, After you get your dab on the dabber, it is time to heat your nail. As you're heating, you want to move the torch around to evenly coat the bottom of the nail. As soon as you start to see a little bit of a red glow, that's when you know the nail is hot enough. After your nail is glowing red, you want to let it sit for a few seconds. When the nail is glowing red, it is approximately 800 degrees. You want to be dabbing at approximately 500 to 650 degrees. The reason you let your nail cool down is if you take a dab too hot, you risk hurting your lungs. Also, you can burn your concentrates and ruin the THC that's inside. If the nail is too cold, you will not vaporize the concentrate properly either, and you will not get the high that you are looking for. To test the heat of your nail, you want to use the side of your hand. You want to be able to place your hand about half an inch from the nail comfortably. If you are not able to leave your hand there comfortably, it is too hot. Once it is slightly warm, you are ready to dab. When your nail is ready, you want to place the dabber on the inside wall of the nail and let the concentrate slide off from the heat. I love Bucky teaching the world how to dab. Uh, yeah, so precise temperatures when you're dabbing are really, really important for preventing yourself from getting like a really hot lung full of air. And that can indeed damage the cells of your lungs. Like inhaling super hot air hurts for a reason. Like it's harsh. Yeah, that is a very big dab. Um, in terms of terminology continued like more there's just so much of it like i said a dime bag this is like again terminology that is phasing out because we have dispensaries coming into the play uh, coming into play all over the country and the world right now a dime bag or a dime is ten dollars of weed my stepmom once infamous infamously asked around the thanksgiving dinner table how much a dime bag cost was it twenty dollars just like completely unironically. I think that was the same Thanksgiving dinner table that she asked what prairie dogging was and we had to explain it to her. So this used to be 
a dime used to be like half a gram of weed back in the day when Eli would roll around in his sedan, but now 10 bucks can get you quite a lot more. It can get you multiple grams of weed in a lot of places. A uh, gram of wax tends to be more expensive. I would say that prices have probably gone down since I last put this in, which is used to be around like 20 to $40. And I would say the prices are probably even, even lower than this right now, depending on where you're buying from, right? Like a dispensary is obviously gonna be differently priced than on the street. And it really depends geographically on where you are. And wax usually lasts a lot longer. This is something that you would dab. Um, and then there's an eighth. An eighth of anything is three and a half grams. So if someone buys an eight or an eight ball of anything, an eight or an eight ball usually refers to like Coke or other powdered substances. Like if someone's like, I, I bought a ball of uh, ketamine, A, that's kind of weird because people don't usually say that in reference to ketamine, but you can. And B, it means three and a half grams. It's just like as a standard unit of measurements. It's an eighth of an ounce. Um, there's a huge culture around growing weed right now, the job of a trimigrant is basically a seasonal gig where people will travel to certain regions of the country or the world that require people during trimming season to basically like pull the plants and trim the leaves off and collect the individual nugs. And this often takes place in Humboldt County, California. There's like a major trimigrant culture there where people will just travel there and be like, looking for work, please hire me to trim your weed. And this is kind of what it looks like. You get a workstation. This was pre-mask. I literally looked at that and was like, where's his mask? Because everything's falling apart. A lot of weed cultivation takes place in North America. Some of it takes place in South America as well, especially Northern South America. That's like a really large area of production as well as regions of Africa. There are a lot of native strains of, of marijuana, cannabis, whatever you want to call it. Um, and then there's hashish production. Remember hashish, like Moroccan hash, is like the, the pressing of concentrates, basically. It's like a more analog version of concentrates. Let's see where we're at. That's how you pick the weeds. And here's the big question that has been asked several times here today is what really is the difference between cannabis or indica and sativa? And the answer is not what you think. There actually isn't because cannabis and, st and sativa, or um, oh my God, shut me up. Indica and sativa don't actually refer to anything except for like the specific genus of cannabis plant. So indica is like a short squat version of the cannabis plant. It's all about the phenotype. It's all about how it looks and how it grows. And sativa tends to be long and skinny. So it's like... Um, I'm trying to think of like a Muppet pairing, like Bert and Ernie maybe, where one is like shorter and rounder and the other is taller and skinnier. I don't remember what Bert and Ernie look like, shame on me. But it's like that basically. I know that there's some dynamic duo that fits that bill. So let me know if you remember one. And the thing about this is that people have come to deeply associate Indica as being like the sleepy, the stony, the more like calming and the more buttery and Sativa to me, the more creative and energetic and um, like lively. And the fact of the matter is that these technical terms only refer to how the plant grows. The reason that we have a strain affiliation is because these plants have been intentionally crossbred to create a specific cannabinoid ratio. So basically how much THC compared to how much CBD and like the ratio of other cannabinoids within it as well. So really what matters is not whether it's indica or sativa, but the actual ratio of cannabinoids within it. So if you've been finding in the past, like, oh, sativa makes me all wired, I don't get it. You should maybe consider trying to find a source where you can actually see the ratio of THC to CBD. Um, terpenes are more complicated. I'm not the authority on terpenes, but the gist of them is that they're kind of like the essential oils of weed. Um, they have their own properties that really do impact the flavor of it, the smell of it, but also the physiological components of it as well. So terpene content really does make a difference in weed. And that's part of the reason that you want um, a full spectrum concentrate, uh, specifically like a live, live resin. Oh my God. I'm like fizzling. Y'all, 
cannot remember the name, the live extraction. Anyway, the point is that you want to maintain the terpenes and that the cannabinoid ratio is really what determines things. But people have intentionally bred sativas to have a higher THC ratio, generally speaking, and intentionally bred indicas to have a higher CBD ratio to make them stonier. Um, then just like to make it clear what we're looking at here, uh, this is hemp. Hemp is basically like a, a way of growing the cannabis plant. I think the specific, yeah, specifically the cannabis sativa plant that is non-psychoactive. Hemp does not contain THC and it's a very sustainable resource. There was actually a huge scandal about how a major paper company in the 20s tried to shut down hemp production and demonize marijuana because it was threatened by the feasibility of hemp being used as a really sustainable resource that could replace paper. Now, there's not a ton of super, yeah, William Randolph Hearst, there's not a ton of super concrete evidence that that was the specific motivation behind it, but it seems fairly likely that that was at least partially involved here. So remember, weed is different, but hemp is in all kinds of stuff. I used hemp's fucking hand sanitizer at getting my hair cut today at a salon in a tiny rural town in Ohio. Like hemp is everywhere now. Weed is infiltrating the masses. So hemp is used to make all kinds of stuff. Um, I'm going to stop there for today. I'm in Oberlin, Ohio. I'm going to stop there for today. Feeling a little bit tired today, so I'm sorry if this is a little bit choppier than usual. Um, thank you guys for tuning in. We will finish cannabinoids, and we're going to get more into like the cultural, the social element of things next time, either on Tuesday, or I'm sorry, on Thursday or next Tuesday. I'm not sure if I'll be around this Thursday. I will let you know in an email day of, probably night of. So have a great night. I'm going to turn off the recording. If there are any questions, I will stick around for like two minutes afterwards.